A lot of what I'm going to talk about here follows on some of the trails that uh, have been set already here at the conference and, and pick up on some of the ideas, uh, particularly that we're hearing earlier this morning from Vic. Uh, but what I'm interested in talking about is how do we think about what we do when we use social technologies. And by social technologies, I don't just mean social media, but mobile phones are social technologies. All right. The original phone was created for someone to call somebody in the other room, not to talk to themselves. Okay? And I think you have to remember as you're thinking about how does all this mobile and social media fit together, it all fits around because it's social. There was a lot of talk yesterday about Facebook and the Facebook IPO. And I will warn you, do not get involved in that for a number of reasons. But the number one reason is because 50% of all the people who go on Facebook do it from their mobile phone. Facebook has no way of monetizing advertising on mobile phones yet. So as more people go on Facebook through mobile phones, the less money Facebook and the advertisers make. Interesting thought. Talk about disruptive. One of the things we're assuming at the conference is that we're all social media specialists. So I'm skipping over all the usual preambles and jumping right into a few ideas that I'd like to share with you. The first is almost every meeting I go to and every time I'm talking with people, someone says something to this effect, that we can reach and change the behavior of our target audience through social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? That's what most of us are trying to do here. Well, I suggest that we really need to rethink that whole idea. Because there are at least five things wrong with that statement. At least five. Okay? And what I'm going to do through this talk is kind of walk through those in an abbreviated form. The first idea is that you can reach people through social networks. All right? We hear these siren calls of 500, 800 million, whatever it happens to be on Facebook or on any of these sites, and we think, what reach can we possibly achieve? And yet, when you heard research studies being reported yesterday, you heard that they finally wound up getting about 9,000. Right. The idea that we can change behavior on these sites. No one becomes a friend with somebody because they're going to change you. People, do, you know, people have this delusion that when you get engaged or when you get married, now I can change the other person. And you know how well that works. But yet we think that if we create friends or followers on Facebook or Twitter, somehow their behavior is going to change. And I can tell you, at least from my point of view, I do not go on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or any of these other sites looking for people to change me. I mean, you know, talk about egocentric models of behavior. How egocentric can that be that we think people are out there looking for us to change them? Right? And that we can change behaviors my question is, what kinds of behaviors do we need to be focusing on? The fact that there aren't target audiences on social networks, and whether social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter are really the places where the action is, as opposed to other places where people are really engaged in health and change issues. The first thing is this whole idea that Toto, our friend down here, revealed in The Wizard of Oz, is that you know, the wizard behind the machine of directing all this reach and all this frequency and all this messaging that's been carefully crafted and carefully tested and carefully uh, delivered is in fact not working in social media. It's not about getting people's attention. It's about earning it on social media. If you do not put content on social media that attracts people's attention and keeps it, they will not be your friends. They will not be your followers. They will not tweet back to you. And so you have to think about how you present yourself very differently from when you're paying for the production, canning the PSA or the advertisement, and delivering it in your own style, in your own way, in your own format. The second thing is this whole idea of behavior. And we constantly talk about behavior as this individual decision-making model, sometimes a very rational process of choosing right from wrong, however we want to define it. And in fact, I want to suggest to you that most of the behavior that we deal with in public health is actually social. And it's not about what the individual thinks when it comes to screening behaviors for prostate cancer or breast cancer. It's not about quitting addictive behaviors like smoking. 
by themselves. It's not about adopting new behaviors like physical activity by themselves. It's not about adhering to treatment, adopting precautions and preparedness ideas, health information seeking, collective action and efficacy are all social behaviors. We always talk about social support. We always talk about doing it with other people. Social influences on our decisions whether to get screened or not. But yet when we get into the social media world, somehow social doesn't occur to us anymore. It all becomes about individuals. And that's because most of us grow up thinking about individual models of change. And I think we need to think about social models of change. Now, when people look at this slide, they also get very confused about these red bubbles under the surface. Because we get so focused on these surface behaviors that we all in public health are concerned about, screening behaviors, addictive behaviors, health information seeking, that in social media we forget what lies under the surface and the behaviors we really need to focus on first. And here's a list of some of them. Monitoring, reading, browsing, searching, sharing, friending, rating, tagging, reviewing, and posting. Most of you probably understand what those words mean. I'll suggest most of the people who you're trying to engage with on social media do not. So how do you even get people to do these kinds of behaviors becomes a critical part of the process. For those of us who have been in this for a while, linking is probably the most important thing to get people to my blog. Uploading content, retweeting content, and then we get into a really complicated set of variables like developing relationships. You know, everyone talks about Twitter as being, you know, what do you have for breakfast? Um, some of the, my best relationships these days are people who I start with on Twitter and then move into deeper relationships with. Working together on social sites. Setting goals together on social sites. How do you promote people to actually participate in a social network? How do you mentor novices who are new to not just Facebook, but to social network sites that help you do your jobs better? How do you set and uphold policies for running social network sites that help people change behaviors or help your organization get more engaged with using social media? These are the big and basic behavioral questions that we need to start addressing before we can start talking about helping people decide whether or not they want to quit smoking and pointing them towards resources that will allow them to do that. So now let's look at some social behaviors. People don't usually think of obesity as a socially influenced behavior. But in fact, data from the Framingham study by Christakis and Fowler showed that it is. Here's some representation of part of the social network at Framingham. Very different way of presenting data, first of all. Right? No tables, no charts, no asterisk, P, significant, 0.05. Uh, looking at social networking data is actually easier for people to process than looking at tables, at least that's what the neurobiologists tell us and the people who study cognition, is that visual data is much easier to interpret here. What you've got here is all the people who are in yellow are the people who have BMIs that suggest they're obese, and all the people in blue are the people who have a normal BMI level. Okay? And of course the sizes there shift only because people who are even bigger get bigger bubbles, but that's kind of beside the point here. The point here is to show you that the yellows stick together and the blues stick together. And what they found over time in the Framingham cohort is that if, you, if your yellow friend changed to a blue friend, that is they went from being overweight to being of more normal weight or lower BMI, you were more likely to change to a blue as well. And that if you were both blues or normal weight, and then one of you flipped to being a yellow over the course of 20 years, the other person was more likely to become a yellow as well. Now that kind of makes sense, and it actually predicted weight gain better than any other variable in the Framingham cohort. And for those of you who don't know Framingham, Framingham's the mother of all risk predictions for heart disease and smoking, high blood pressure, and cholesterol levels. So it's a pretty solid base of, of uh, data to start drawing conclusions from. The other interesting thing about this study was it didn't matter where your friend lived, whether they were a coworker, whether they were your next door neighbor, 
or whether in the course of those 20 years they moved to the other side of the country, if they flipped from a yellow to blue, you were more likely to flip from a yellow to a blue. So that's really odd. All right? And that's Framingham data before there were social networks. Now imagine what happens when you're staying in touch with that friend even more closely over the course of 20 years, and those kinds of changes start happening in them. How contagious is obesity for you? Here's another set of data from that same Framingham study, only this time we're looking at smoking. And here, 1971, all those yellows are smokers. Lots of tobacco use in Framingham, 1971. And all the blue dots are the uh, non-smokers. And again, you can see how all those things cluster together. Not necessarily absolutely. You know, there are smokers who are friends with non-smokers. But for the most part, it's a very tight, clustered behavior. Now, just like with obesity, what we see over the course of 29 years in this project is, hey, look at all the blues. Same people, look at all the blues 29 years later. All the people who have quit are no longer smokers. And then look at the relative density of the yellows. But also look at the fact that how the yellows have shifted from being kind of in the center of all these networks to being on the periphery, to being on the outside of many of these networks. Now, if you want to talk about what is a social normative shift, that's it. That's what a social network analysis allows you to look at and allows you to start thinking about. And in fact, what we find is that when people quit smoking, guess what? So did their friends. All right. It wasn't about which program did they use or what nicotine replacement therapy did they use. It was about what their friends do. And just to kind of cap this off, We'll change the uh, color dynamics here. Talking about happiness, guess who the blue people are? The more depressed. The yellow ones are the kinds of the in-between ones, or they're the happy ones, I should say, and the green ones are kind of the in-between ones. So bright and sunny, blue and depressed, intermediate. And again, just look at this, and you very quickly pick up all right, that your blues tend to hang out together, and your yellows tend to hang out together. Happiness is contagious, just like your mother or grandmother used to tell you. Stick with people who make you smile. Okay. So, there's, so social influences on behavior are all around us. And these are just a few examples. But we don't tend to pull that data into our thinking. And I think with social networks, we really need to. We need to be thinking about how do we look at data in social networks that use these kinds of ideas. Average path length, centralization, reciprocity. Um, this is a whole another half hour. Briefly, how do we influence a network? If you're looking at a social network and you look at a very schematic representation of one, if I ask you to influence this social network and pick the individual represented by one of these dots who would be the most influential person in that network, most people would tend to go here, right? The most connections. And in fact, you'd be dead wrong. All right? That the most influential person in this network is this person, who is only two links away from any other person in that network, as opposed to this person, who, as you can see, becomes three links away from some people. All right. So that's just, you know, some people say, OK, so what? This gets really interesting when you look at data uh, that Valente, for instance, did in California, where he looked at community coalitions and looked at how dense they were, how well adjusted they were, how well they worked together, versus coalitions that were less dense, were less well connected, and were kind of made up on the spot. And these coalitions had as their charge to, to do drug abuse prevention programs in their communities. They had a new program. Their hypothesis was if we introduce this new program for drug abuse prevention in schools, networks that are very tight and well connected like this will be most likely to implement that curriculum in the schools. And networks that are less dense, less well coordinated, less well connected will probably not get their act together 
to really do this well. Make sense? And of course the story is that exactly the opposite happens. Because what happens is when you aim at these people who are very well insulated from the outside world, group think, whatever you want to call it happens, they are the most likely to resist innovations. And Valenti's group was very surprised to find out that the best organized, best connected, best run meeting coalitions were the ones who refused to do the new intervention. Thank you very much, we're happy with where we are. So you really have to think about networks in a kind of way that is not our usual thought process. One last study just to demonstrate it again. This was a study by Santola who asked who recruited people and then put them into a new social network in which no one knew each other and people were randomly assigned. These red dots meant that one person was assigned to this new social network in which all their buddies, they get five buddies, are all spaced right next to them. There's only one link between each one of them versus people who were assigned to this group where their buddies, these red dots, were spread throughout a very interconnected network. So these networks are structured very differently. Anybody could be randomly associated with five other people in this network, whereas here you could only be associated with people very close proximity to you. Think about friends on Facebook as an example. When they then asked people to join a health information website, the only information they got back in this network was when their friends joined. So they weren't talking to each other, but they would hear about when one of their friends joined. And what they found, interestingly enough, is that the network that was most likely to increase the number of people who signed up for the website and did it most quickly was in fact this one, not this one. And so we think about, well, how do we make our networks and how do we make people more interconnected? And there's at least experimental evidence to suggest that when it comes to health information, you may not want to be thinking like that. You may want to be thinking about how do we put, the, put people together uh, very closely in networks so that they can do their own thing rather than dragging them into one large uh, random site. So when we're thinking about social media, focusing on the relationships that we're trying to build with those media rather than the tools becomes very important. And I'm going to switch kind of as the last um, set of points to talk a little bit about what are the lessons you can take away from social media campaigns that have been conducted in the private sector world. And I think these are really relevant for what we're all talking about here when we think about changing behaviors in public health and other kinds of health scenarios. First, I think a lot of people have learned that viral is not a strategy. When you sit down and think about, we're going to plan a campaign, how can we make it viral, you're going down a, uh, a blind alley. Viral happens, and you should celebrate it when it does, but don't think about how do we create a viral strategy. Old Spice did not set out to create a viral strategy. When they found out it was going viral, they very quickly took advantage of that. All right? But viral happens more by happenstance than by design. In the social media world, it's what people say about you that's most important, not what you're saying to them. Trust becomes a really big element of social media. Your brand or your equity become equally important to the people you're engaging as well as to yourself. People are already motivated to do things. You know, going into the social media space saying we need to motivate people to do something is counterproductive. What we need to do is find people who are motivated, whether it's motivated to change their behavior, whether it's motivated to help others, whether it's motivated to evangelize for our cause. That's what you need to be tapping into in social media. Social media, people do not go on social media to be changed. Relationships and knowledge are the best social currency. And there's too many times people go on to social media, they set up a site, they kind of send out their message, you know, every day or three times a day or whatever their frequency happens to be, and never respond to anybody's comments. And it's, it's kind of confusing to see that happening so often, but behind that is that old way of thinking about communications. You're creating sustained interest. 
Whenever people look at health communication campaigns and most behavior change campaigns, we always talk about, well, but do, do the effects last? In social media, we really have an opportunity to start talking about making effects last, not just changing behavior. So sustaining change, I think, is part of what needs to be the conversation we have. People talk about buying advertising on social media. The evidence from the corporate world says you're wasting your money. You are not getting the bang for your buck uh, that you could be if you were using your social media better. Social media sites and applications have different capabilities. Again, you know, going on Facebook may not be the most important place to go. Dana Boyd talks about MySpace as the place where most of the geeks and freaks hang out. And when, most, when you start thinking about where the big public health problems lie, they do not lie with people who go on a blue and white, you know, academic looking website. They go to a place like MySpace, and for people who go to MySpace, MySpace is a very different place. But MySpace is more likely where you'll find the people who have the health problems you really want to be serving. But yet we go where we're comfortable, rather than where the people are. Random unplanned usage of these tactics delivers poor results. And social media is an amplifier of campaign messages. And thinking about it as the way we put our campaign message out is probably not the best idea because you're going to have very limited exposure of that campaign. Notice I didn't say reach. Reach is a broadcast variable. And there's no reason not to use broadcast for what it does well and use social media for what it can do well when you're thinking through these processes. It's when we stop thinking about this, all these worlds, whether it's mobile or social media, as technology, and when we start thinking about it as something that will actually help people improve their lives, is that we can then start moving beyond this idea of when and where and how to use social media. Because it's how people use social media in their lives and how we can have an influence on that and engage with them during that process that I think becomes the power of this new media. So I'll leave there, Lenore Johnson kind of gave this away yesterday, but the map is not the terrain. Even though you can go in with a good plan for social media, when you get into social media, if you're not ready to be spontaneous, if you're not ready to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that happen, you're not going to be as effective. This is, you know, this, this is a very fluid process because you're engaging with real people in real time, not some broadcaster and not some advertiser who's just putting you on at certain segments of the day. And also that the tools are not the engine. That simply because you know how to use Facebook doesn't mean Facebook becomes your campaign. Think about it from your audience point of view before you make those decisions. And I'll thank you very much and hand it back off to Sanjay.